Welcome everybody to this uh, RSS Royal Statistical Society special topic meeting. Uh, my name is Peter Diggle and I've had the pleasure and privilege of co-organising this event with our president, uh, Professor Sylvia Richardson, who will also be chairing the Friday sessions. Um, the meeting has its origins in a discussion within the RSS COVID task force about the statistical challenges and in some sense uh, question marks around the much quoted national level R number of the current epidemic. Um, we've we invited a number of uh, authors to present their views on this topic and related topics. So we do now have a rather broader agenda than just the magic R number. Uh, and in particular, over the three sessions, we'll see a range of commentary on aspects of modeling and monitoring the epidemic that bear close statistical inspection. Uh, within each session, uh, we'll be starting with presentations by the authors. We'll then have uh, contributions from invited discussants uh, the authors will be speaking for approximately 15 minutes and the invited discussants uh, can speak for up to 10 minutes. And then uh, anybody in the audience uh, can speak for five minutes if they wish to do so. Uh, and, uh, and then we will close the session with, uh, if there is time, with a Q&A of more informal bullet point style questions from the audience. If you do want to make a bullet point style question, please put it in the the chat, or I think the, uh, the the team's word is conversation, and Luth Martinez from head office is um, going to be keeping an eye on that, and I can read out those questions on specific points uh, at the end if time permits. Um, I'll then invite the authors to reply briefly, reminding them that in the time-honoured tradition since 1834, they have the opportunity to present a more reflective response to the discussion in writing, and everything will ultimately appear in an electronic publication under the Royal Statistical Society banner. Um, just a couple of points uh, specifically uh, aiming at, uh, in particular, anybody who does choose to make, um, uh, you've already been asked to switch off your mobile phones, um, is, is if you are making a contribution from the floor, then Please do remember that we will need a written version of your comments if you wish to be included in the proceedings, and we'll need that by Monday the 19th of January. Uh, and you will need to tell Luth Martinez through the conversation, through the chat, um, that you would like to uh, present, and then uh, you'll be able, if you need to, to share your screen. You don't need to do that if you're simply speaking. Uh, you, can, uh, you can switch your camera on and you'll be visible. Uh, but if you do have a, any slides you want to present, please go on camera. No? Then you will, uh, you will, uh, you will need to um, let Luth know. Okay. So uh, the first of three talks today is uh, um, by uh, Parag and colleagues, and I believe the paper is being presented by Chris Parag, and uh, I will therefore invite him to give his presentation. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. Let me just get the. Okay, I assume everyone can see that. I certainly can. Yes, great. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak about this. This is um, some work with Robin Thompson and Chris O'Donnelly. And we were just asking the question. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about epidemic growth rates and reproduction numbers and perhaps what relationship they may have. And we sort of wanted to probe a bit into that and see if we could uncover maybe some of the underlying assumptions. And it sort of fits within a general background of these real-time outbreak analytics, which we've seen quite popularly across the pandemic. So these parameters or variables that people use uh, or present to visualize how transmissibility of a pathogen may be changing. And we want to use this in some meaningful way to sort of a just broad background. Some of the problems we could solve with these are to try and get some sort of insight into certain factors that might be influencing spread, or we may want to test some hypotheses about, for example, levels of super spreading, uh, a pretty popular one is to use these num like these parameters to look at what, for example, lockdowns or quarantines might be doing, uh, or to forecast possible cases. Uh, so of a slightly uh, more uh, tr trickier one, perhaps, is also to communicate it to the public, bearing in mind that the awareness you bring to them may have a 
may lead to a feedback loop on the actual values of the parameters since presumably an informed public might be more into more conservative contact-based behaviors. And the follow-on from that is to ask, what are these analytics? And by analytic, I just mean some sort of parameter variable, as you'll come to, is what is a meaningful one in the sense that we know that whatever we estimate from will depend on the quality of data, on the assumptions within the techniques we might use to estimate them. And we want them to be quite interpretable. We want to be able to compare them. We want to sort of get change points where transmission properties or rates uh, might uh, vary. We want to be able to pick those up. And ultimately, that somehow always involves a bias variance trade-off on some estimated parameter. And we don't want to depend too much on our prior assumptions, but have some degree of expert knowledge built in. Usually, because there's um, some limits to surveillance data, particularly in responding in real time, we'll use some type of simplified model. And this is where the instantaneous reproduction number, RFT, which is what we'll talk about a lot, comes in quite often. It's one of the most popular metrics for describing transmission, and I guess sort of the key uh, discussion point of this meeting. So just to provide like some tiny bit of background on that, uh, we could look at two very simple, super simplified processes of an epidemic. So we could have a, a very simple branching process in which an uh, infected person produces offspring infected people, and we could say very informally, so it's not very rigorous at this point, that if uh, an R to reproduction number of two at this across this period would mean that on average you'd have, and this is on average, you'd have two uh, new offspring. And say we maybe had some intervention at this point that knocked that down to one, you'd then have on average again about one being followed to a sustained epidemic. You could look at a linearized SIR model where C just indicates active cases. And again, you could set, a, set this up such that we have some contact rate and some uh, recovery rate, which is all common in the literature. And you'd get an exponential type behavior and you could again define an R of T. But perhaps the, the growth rate, the instantaneous growth rate, which is a time varying growth rate is is could equally be fit onto these very simple models conceptually and often gets a lot less represented in the literature. So if we go back to this branching process, I should mention this W here is a generation time, which is the time for an infected person to infect someone else. So the, and this would be the average time of that. So you could get, again, a positive growth rate in this region where we had R above one, and you get a zero growth rate in this region. And if you go back to the second model, you could again draw out some simple relationships between these numbers. And sort of, if you look at that, just sort of informally, there's there's a two, two, two things that would come up. One is that, why not use growth rates? It seems to have a lot of the same information as they are, at least in terms of the sign, if anything else. And it also has this temporal component here with the generation time, so the time between infections or the time along the infection chain. And that is kind of the, the background for this piece of work, which is that recently there have been a couple of critiques of the effective reproduction number which propose the instantaneous growth rate as the more meaningful analytic. And it's probably worth just mentioning there's a lot of similar sounding uh, metrics. For example, the basic reproduction number is the most popular or not. Or uh, there's uh, just R, which is the intrinsic growth rate. And those are usually just applied at the beginning of the epidemic. And we're in interested in those time varying ones that could give us, for example, transmissibility across multiple waves of a, pan of a pandemic, say. And sort of these critiques recommend that maybe the small RFT, this growth rate, might be uh, additionally useful because it's a model agnostic. Technically, you could just compute growth rates from epidemic curves. You don't need to think about your model per se. Uh, and there's all that temporal information via like that generation time thing. But even in general, a growth rate is a per day or per you know, it, it translates into some very uh, nice temporal meaning, whereas an RT of two, for example, on its own, you don't know how long that approximate doubling will take, if you don't know the generation times at least. So it comes down to maybe there's fewer assumptions needed. And to kind of just, uh, just visually put that forth, 
uh, if you've made a bunch of different compartmental models, and I've done this for the basic and the intrinsic because I've taken this off um, a Lloyd paper, but it, it has the same idea, which is that give, the growth rate would be dependent on the epidemic curve, so that would be pretty much the same, but you get very different, potentially very different R0 and R0 relationships, and hence RT relationships, based on the model of choice. So that's kind of where this assumption idea comes from. So before we like dig into that, we want to maybe just take a slight step back and have a look at how we might estimate these quantities because that's where the practical component comes in. So we we'll present here, uh, taken from sort of the other literature, a different way of computing growth rates, but it very much mirrors what people are doing. And that would be to take our incidence curve, so a number of new cases every day, say, and apply some type of smoothing where I of t is the incidence on, on day t or time t. This is some type of smoothing operator, and we take a derivative of the log of that, and that will give us an estimate of the intrinsic, uh, the instantaneous growth rate. And a quite general framework to do that uh, would be what we call a Savitsky Gole filter, SG filter, which is just a type of digital filter uh, that uses least squares to tune um, its coefficients. And you could write that very simply as uh, if this is the smoothed curve at some time t. It's just a, a convolution of the incidence with these smoothing kernel coefficients. And this is just a quite general framework that then comes from chemistry and engineering. And it fits a lot of different types of, it doesn't fit every single type of smoothing, but a lot of different types of smoothing you might apply. And perhaps the most popular one would be just a weekly moving average filter that uh, you always see that being presented when, say, you look on Waldometer or any of these things. And that would simply say something like each coefficient will be set to one and seven, and we kind of span through seven days the time of the incidence in a sort of overlapping way. Then we could look at estimates of uh, instantaneous reproduction numbers. And for that, uh, for this study, we would just say to think about the renewal model, which is a quite popular version, a popular way of doing this. And you could, what it effectively does is it, it somewhat generalizes the previous two models I spoke about, the SR and the, uh, and the branching process, by bringing in a full generation time distribution. And all it presume, assumes is that the average incidence at some point in time depends on a product of two things, the effective reproduction number and this lambda of t, which is called the total infectiousness. And that effectively says how many effective cases are transmitting forward. So it looks at past incidents and weighs them by the generation time, where WJ would be, for example, the probability that the generation uh, time uh, takes J days, or probably the infection takes J days to be transmitted. We then put some type of noise model. I put POS on here just because it's the most popular. And then you could use some Bayesian inference technique to get the instantaneous reproduction number. What's good about this is you could then uh, just slightly ex um, make use of some theory for R0 and the, base, and the intrinsic growth rate to just say we could convert this into a model-based growth estimate. So previously we had a model agnostic one. This is just a model-based one that goes with the effective reproduction number. And I won't go into it too much, but all it says is that there's a relationship that depends on the moment generating function of the generation time distribution. And if the generation time distribution was a gamma distribution, for example, we'd again get a nice explicit expression. And this is used a lot because gamma distributions are quite often used, for example, COVID, Ebola, and so on. So then we sort of set up the framework now. Let's just have a look at what information is actually in these two, if you want to say, competing uh, analytics. So we could simulate some type of seasonal epidemic where the red is a true R of T. Uh, so in this case, I think the parameters are chosen to match roughly an Ebola virus epidemic. And we could estimate our effective reproduction number using one of many methods. We use this epifilter method here because it's minimum mean squared error, but there's a ton of good ones. And then we could convert, we could do two things. We could convert first our model uh, RT ones into a model based growth rate, which is this red one, or we could do the smoothing thing via the SG filters, which is this gray one. And we have a third one that I'll talk about in a bit, but 
And what you could see is quite clearly wherever the reproduction number sort of intersects the one, we do get the growth rate intersecting zero. We get the peaks lining up. So there's very much the same temporal information if you look into these, uh, and if you look into this example. But the third curve is quite interesting because what it's saying effectively, I'll come back to it, is that we could also interpret this total infectiousness term as a type of SG filter as well. And it's just really by playing with a bit of coefficients, but because there's a convolution there too. But what it says is then we could get another estimate of the growth rate by just taking the derivative of the log of that. And that's where uh, this blue one came. And you see they all sort of align quite nicely. And if we looked at the smoothed uh, incidence curves, the one from the lambda is quite similar to the one from our sort of arbitrary model agnostic uh, SG filter. The tau here just means there's been a shifting uh, to a line by the generation time distribution. So this kind of exposes like the key assumption between these two approaches, perhaps, because what we're saying is we either we could do the RT and get a growth rate and at that point, we're, we're making some sort of epidemiological assumption. So, the, so for example, this is acting like an epi, the generation time distribution is acting like an epidemiological smoothing kernel. Or we could do the sort of, let's not think about models, but then let's do some type of smoothing. But actually, we haven't really gotten away from these assumptions. We've traded them for a different type. But in some sense, they're all mathematically equivalent or at least similar. And this is kind of this is just another example with uh, more COVID type dynamics to show that the story is pretty much the same. So then that kind of like splits out how to treat perhaps these two uh, outbreak analytics, because we can say for the reproduction number estimates, if we if and it's a big if if we have accurate estimates of the generation time distribution then our reproduction numbers will be more informative. And that's because uh, they provide some type of mechanistic insight that you could communicate uh, and then non-dimensional. So for example, if RT is equal to two, we know we might want to block one half of all contacts, for example, or at least informally you could communicate that. So there's a sort of relative component there. And you get the other um, growth rates on other things such as herd immunity thresholds and elimination probabilities. But of course, going back to the if, we have the issue that because generation times are based on times of infections, we tend to do things like approximate them by serial interval distributions, which are based on times of symptom onsets. Uh, and it's sometimes hard Chris, to deal. Two minutes more if possible, yep. please. Thank yep, you. sure. To stop with the non-stationaryness uh, of interventions and biases, you have to account for that. So that brings you to the question of, when is when a growth rate likely to be more informative and that's going back to that idea of misspecification if there's significant misspecification then as in this example here where the blue one is with the true generation time and the red one with a misspecified one we see our rt is really sort of like disentangle but we still get a reasonable view of the growth rate so you get a lot more robustness for that type of misspecification using growth rate so it's it's more informative there. It's also really good for speed because of its link to doubling and halving times. And it has a very natural unit for absolute spread. So you're probably less likely to have an over-interpretation of what it means. So this kind of like just brings us to the, the sort of final discussion points that flow from this uh, analysis is that, so both analytics do have some complementary insights to give. It's important to remember that while I think both could be necessary and you don't actually have to choose between one or the other, they're not sufficient. So when we were talking about these thresholds, uh, uh, growth rates of zero or reproduction numbers of one, uh, they could have very different policy implication, implications if we had say 10 cases per day co coming or 10,000. And this sort of key underlying point is what assumptions we're willing to make. The RT ones might be more explicit because of that generation time. You might ignore the, uh, the growth rate ones because of smoothing, and those are sort of implicit but equally important, at least according to this analysis. Um, because we also don't, we haven't talked about surveillance biases and how they might affect it, it just seems to suggest that, uh, yeah, reporting both, as is done in the UK, is definitely a good idea. And it also very cleanly 
provide some impetus for why um, model averaging might be a good approach as well, because testing against structural uncertainty, as Summer pointed out, might be one of the key things. And this sort of comes out given that it, it effectively boils down to which assumptions we're willing to make. As we're just mentioning that more complex models may not help here because they will potentially involve more assumptions and uncertainty. So it's kind of, I don't, I think for similar levels of information, you're going to maybe make similar levels of assumptions. And so we could then sort of say, well, maybe we should just reframe this question that we asked in the first place and ask, which assumptions are we more happy to make? Are we happier to make going forward in an analysis of transmissibility across time? Um, so yeah, that completes uh, the talk. Thank you very much, Chris. If you could stop screen sharing, please. Sure. And we'll move to our second presentation. Uh, this is a paper by Nick Jewell and Joe Lunard, and I believe they're sharing the presentation with Nick uh, kicking off first. In which case, over to you, Nick. Thank you. I'm trying to um, open the... Uh, Vertical arrow towards the top right of the yeah, screen. Yeah, I'm doing that, but I'm not seeing any... Um, any of my computer as before. Ah. Hi, Nick. Um, this is Luz. Do you want to give it a yeah. go and share straight away your screen instead of share the window? Say that again, Luz. Do you want to share your screen instead of sharing your window? I was trying that, but the um, Windows are different from when we did the presentation. I can't see it now. That's absolutely fine. So I'm um, close to share content tray. Is the presentation open in your computer already? Yeah, it's open already. Fantastic. Okay. So let's share the content tray again. And um, can you tell me what, what are you seeing? Uh, let me try. Okay, that is working. Fantastic. I think. I think. Yeah, we have it, Nick. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for Joe uh, Lunar, who's at the University of California, Berkeley, and I to make a few comments. Um, the um, the spirit of these comments are to think about the reproductive number, or for that matter, the infection growth rate, as Chris has just described, and their practical uh, use in policy setting for interventions associated with the, the pandemic. Um, and so we're going to make, this is sort of setting the stage, I hope, for other presentations in this um, discussion meeting that will come today and, and in the future, uh, the two future sessions. Um, so we're going to focus, our comments here will focus on, on the reproductive number, and we're interested in very pragmatic questions about how that reproductive number translates into what we actually see empirically on the ground uh, in terms of whether it's useful um, to as a metric for policy decisions and evaluation. Um, so as we as we all know, um, the reproductive number is a multifactorial metric in the sense that it depends on several different aspects of transmission. Uh, we've uh, outlined them here. Of course, it depends on the intensity of contacts and the types of contacts that are made. Uh, it depends on the transmissibility or infectivity associated with those uh, contacts. And it depends on um, the, the length of time individuals remain infectious. And each of these um, aspects of the reproductive number, of course, are well-known targets for different, quite different kinds of intervention. And one of the questions that I guess um, we have as members of the public or scientists or policymakers are whether current policies are sufficient to prevent uncontrolled um, growth. And um, we're well aware of a lot of fantastic work in using epidemic models to understand the role of the reproductive number and how different interventions 
uh, mediate and affect that number in in uh, in vitro in a sense. But our issue here is how do well are they really playing out in vivo when there's of course quite complex feedback dynamics in place and how do we develop empirical assessments of how changes in the reproductive number induced by policy changes, are they actually caused by the decisions that are being um, made? And I'll go on to, um, Joe is going to present this slide. Thanks, Nick. Um, so one question that arises from uh, the way that R has been uh, widely uh, disseminated as a measure of um, uh, epidemic activity, if you will, in uh, in various settings, and in particular in the context of policy uh, decisions, is how useful um, changes in R end up being as a barometer for um, for uh, setting various non-pharmaceutical intervention measures in place or relaxing them. Um, in uh, many uh, settings, uh, there's been very close uh, uh, monitoring of changes in R, um, uh, whether whether that should be described as RT or some other uh, kind of time varying. Uh, of R, um, uh, they, they, they've often been um, the center of, of, um, of, of much coverage and uh, and attention um, in particular uh, uh, as, a, as a question of whether um, interventions that have been implemented uh, should be uh, turned on or off essentially. Um, and I think there's even been many cartoons that people have probably kind of a decision in, in various media. Um, one issue that arises with uh, monitoring sometimes very small uh, changes in R, even on the order of you know 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 in terms of absolute magnitude, is whether this actually provides a meaningful measure of population risk and whether there is adequate understanding of R as a measure of essentially the growth potential for um, for an epidemic versus the current state of risk to members of the public. Um, and what may have been missing in some of this um, um, uh, considerable attention focused on changes in R over time um, is that it is not in any sense a measure of the current prevalence of infection and thus absolute risk to people in a particular set. Um, in fact, prevalence of infection uh, has over the course of the outbreak, as well as in uh, comparisons from one setting to another, likely varied by many orders of magnitude, um, whereas R uh, has generally varied within a single order of magnitude um, across settings. Um, one could say that in throughout much of the epidemic, um, uh, settings such as uh, uh, Taiwan, for instance, to, to set an example, or New Zealand had conditions that could sustain high um, reproductive numbers in their populations, yet these were very safe environments um, to, to uh, go about without uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions such as of infection and somehow missing from much of the uh, monitoring um, of R was a discussion of absolute risk uh, that, that, uh, that should be considered when making um, uh, decisions about, about implementing or relaxing interventions in response to epidemiologic con uh, conditions on the ground. Thanks, Joe. So we're not going to cover here um, things that we'll probably hear a great deal about in, in this meeting, which is um, the uh, necessary data and est uh, estimation methods for R. There are a number of uh, references already being given and others that we've put here that uh, compare and describe um, estimation techniques. I think all of them reflect that, um, that the, at the very fundamental of basis as statisticians, the absence of high quality data really compromises all of these methods. And um, there are still remaining challenges to try and match uh, estimation methods to the kind of data that is available. Um, and that, uh, so data processing of the available data remains uh, a real uh, obstacle to getting good high quality information about the growth of the epidemic. And so that there are real challenges that persist even with so-called uh, good data. I think one of the main issues that um, plagues policymakers are that 
the reproductive number estimates are necessarily lagged. Um, they're lagged by the time, uh, if you're using infections as the, the source of reproduction, they're lagged by uh, several weeks. Um, if you're using hospitalizations or deaths, which may provide more reliable or quote good data, the lag becomes even greater. And we'll touch on that in a second. Uh, and there's also um, a great desire and need to provide local estimation of R, which requires, of course, high quality local uh, data in addition. Um, and uh, and, and uh, ig uh, ignoring of the fact that with very granular estimates of the reproductive number, there can be real um, misperceptions because of the mobility of population across regions that may be sharing apparently sharing different reproduction number a few weeks in the past, but that the mobility can really uh, distort what that tells you about the risk uh, today. Uh, and we have a, two or three lessons in, in, our, uh, in our presentation just for, to uh, promote discussion. The first one is that policy needs to move extremely fast. I think that was the thing we learned the most in uh, the first few months of 2020. Uh, in the presence of exponential growth, weeks are actually a very long period of time, um, and things can change rather dramatically on the ground uh, in a few weeks. And this was a graphic that um, uh, my daughter, Britta Jewell, and I uh, presented in the New York Times re referring to the United States epidemic, which pointed out that with um, using empirical estimates of how the epidemic was proceeding at that point, uh, if the policy, intervention policies of social distancing and the like had been T20 would have been reduced by, um, would have been reduced by 60%. Um, and that was ultimately an estimate, the back of the envelope estimate that was ultimately um, supported by um, more sophisticated modeling um, out of NYU uh, later in the year. So 60% reduction for one week, 90% reduction in deaths if you had moved two weeks earlier, which reflects how a, a week or two has a huge impact ultimately in in while you're in the middle of exponential growth. For the last little, um, the last uh, third of our talk, we just want to now talk a little bit about, given these issues about the lag of the reproductive number, that we're seeing things a little bit in the past, are there predictive proxies for R or other measures that would give us a better... Okay, um, and so we're interested in correlates of the uh, reproductive number and to what extent empirically on the ground, you see that changes in the reproductive number um, are influenced or associated with changes in other measures. This is complicated because of the, the multifactorial dependence of R, but we've got three little examples here. This was one that uh, both Joe and I were involved in, in Looking at mobility, this was actually measured by Apple Maps um, measures, but uh, there are similar analyses based on Google Maps. And it shows in the graphic there, the and again, in the spring and early summer of last year, um, how changes in mobility were um, associated with changes in estimates of the uh, effective reproductive number. And, and you may prefer to look, this graph should really be looked chronologically from right to left because at that period of time, mobility was reducing. And if you look at the right-hand graph, that's the multiplier, which was showing in different uh, regions of the United States, how reductions in mobility, as you move from right to left, were associated with uh, relative reductions in the reproductive number over time. And, and I guess the without belaboring points here, but to open discussion, of course, this relationship is not fully causal. Uh, this is an association. Um, and, and the main point here is that the relationship is quite different um, 
geographically. So you can see there, Louisiana responded to changes in mobility much more dramatically than um, New York City uh, for reasons that should be obvious to those who know those two regions well. Um, and another point is that this is looking back in time, which is what much of the analysis of reproduction numbers has done. There's no guarantee that when we move in reverse in terms of mobility, when we start easing restrictions and increasing mobility, that the impact on the reproductive number will be the same. The second example here is looking at data Nick, from- Two minutes yep. if possible, please. Okay, yep, thank you. Um, looking at data on vaccination in Israel, the graphic there shows two different easing of uh, lockdown restrictions in Israel. The blue is a, a, a second wave, which was uh, the autumn of last year. And then the, the uh, Amber is the third wave, which was the early spring of this year. The difference being that as e lockdown restrictions were eased in both the situations, the amber had the presence of vaccinations were increasing. And vaccinations were increasing linearly over that period. And so in principle, you could tie the um, change in vaccination prevalence in the country to changes in reproduction number. And the third area where R depends on things, which is the duration of infectiousness, are uh, studies that have looked at interventions in, uh, in that regard, test and trace programs from the National Health Service is one example, and how they influence the changes in the reproductive number. So let's just um, draw this to a conclusion. Um, Joe is going to just present this slide, and then I'll do the last one. Very briefly, um, just uh, to uh, make this uh, pandemic and will be a need during future ones uh, for better and more coordinated epidemiologic data collection along the lines of the REACT study in the UK, which looked at real time population prevalence of infection. Um, there are historical examples even uh, before um, influenza virus was known as a pathogen where the U.S. Public Health Service um, launched uh, national representative household surveys to measure uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, and, and unfortunately, there have not been many other examples of, of this kind of uh, systematic data collection um, arising in the current uh, pandemic. And so just to finish with the sort of third lesson is that um, I think it's uh, important as commissions are formed and planning is already in place for how we can better respond to pandemics or is there a better system of how we take uh, once we built better data surveillance systems how do we take that data and translate it into policy actions and um, this kind of activity is going on both on both sides of the atlantic as um, people try and think about um, how well did we respond to the current pandemic in terms of our the scientific information from data translating into policy implementations? I think the answer is we didn't do very well on either side of the Atlantic. And so the question remains, how do we do that better? And we'll leave that to the discussion. Um, thanks very much, uh, Peter. Back to you. Thank you, Nick and Joe. Uh, and then the third and last paper in this session, yes, if you could stop screen sharing, Nick, that'd be good, uh, is from Luke Coffeng uh, and Sake de Las. And I believe, Luke, you're presenting on your and Sake's uh, part. Floor yes. Floor. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you to both uh, Sylvia and Peter for inviting uh, us to, pre to present this work. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a statistician. I'm a mathematical modeler based in Rotterdam. I have a ba medical background and my work is mostly focused on, on informing public health policy. And as I have a special interest in, uh, in uh, or for the impact of heterogeneity in, in transmission uh, dynamics, my talk today is about uh, the impact of heterogeneous settings on the uh, predicted impact of interventions. And our point of the point of this uh, presentation is that we argue that standard SEIR models uh, are too pessimistic. I'll start with uh, uh, setting out 
uh, the stage uh, by saying that the, there's heterogeneity in models themselves, of course. We have a range of different modeling approaches ranging from deep deterministic models to highly complex individual-based explicit network models. And uh, along this spectrum, uh, various groups are, are doing uh, uh, work. Uh, our group at Rotterdam Medical Center, Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, we are specialized in individual-based modeling. And we recently developed an uh, individual-based SEIR model for COVID-19 uh, that included metapopulations or multiple populations and assortative mixing. Um, but no age structure, unlike many other models that are being used by the Dutch Public Health Institute or uh, uh, Neil Ferguson's group at Imperial College. Um, as the previous two speakers already highlighted and, and introduced, uh, the impact of heterogeneity has, has been investigated at length. And I think all the points I make here have already been made by them. Basically, estimates of R are specific to model type, structure, and assumptions that the modelers make. And individual variation uh, or heterogeneity in, 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 in contact patterns and mixing, all that is important for these estimates and the predictions that these models um, produce. However, to our knowledge, uh, an open question is, is uh, the extent to which heterogeneity plays a role in later stages of the epidemic when interventions may actually be lifted, say in our current situation where uh, we're nearing, we're, we're, we seem to near the end of the, the COVID-19 uh, phase in most uh, Western Europe, uh, Western societies. Um, as I said, we focus on individual-based modeling uh, of geographical heterogeneity. And initially the aim of, of this uh, modeling exercise was to explore geographically stratified uh, strategies. Um, to do this, we, we developed, like I said, a, a metapopulation model that involved local, regional, and national transmission routes and policies for controlling infection. Because it's an individual-based model, we, we capture individual variation in contact rates, disease history, and adherence to uh, intervention measures. And we include the possibility for assortative mixing, meaning that individuals with more similar contact rates are more likely to be in the same community and mix among each other. And with this model, we, we intended to predict uh, case numbers over time and IC load in the Netherlands, as well as the population uh, recovered and presumably immune to a uh, second infection. Um, as part of the modeling uh, process, we, we stumbled on some challenges that, that were the uh, uh, inspiration or starting points of the work that I'm presenting here today. And to, to explain that, I will first show you a, a graphical representation of, of this metapopulation uh, model. Um, this is a schematic of, well, a highly stylized schematic of a country or a region where every circle is a community of people, on average 1,000 people, and bigger circles represent larger communities and smaller Circles represent smaller communities, and each of these circles is governed by an individual-based SEIR model. And we call these circles clusters. And these clusters are organized in superclusters that can be taken to represent provinces or administrative areas. And all these superclusters together represent a larger region or a country. Uh, this work was uh, recently, <laughs> so 2021, not 12. <laughs> was uh, uh, published in the scientific reports. Um, yes, so what we did for, for today's presentation is we performed a simulation study to investigate the impact of lift, lifting interventions towards the end of an epidemic using uh, the Versim uh, package in R, which is the, the, the model I just described. And we simulated a number of scenarios varying only the assumptions about heterogeneity in mixing and contact patterns. And for each of these scenarios, we recalibrated the transmission rate and the estimated intervention effects based on the fictive data. And then we simulated forward in time what uh, what the impact might be of lifting interventions. 
Um, the biological parameters in the model were fixed for now, uh, reminiscent of COVID-19. And to make it all computationally manageable, we performed 500 repeated simulations uh, for each scenario for a population of uh, 10,000 persons. Um, we considered three scenarios for heterogeneity. The first is the simplest homo homogeneous mixing, meaning there's only one population, everybody mixes with everybody, and there's no variation between individuals uh, in terms of their contact rates. Then the second, uh, uh, second scenario is where we consider inter-individual variation in individual contact rates, where we specify the but by contact rate, we mean the product of the actual contact rate and transmission probability, which in a normal um, ordinary differential equation would be uh, represented by um, parameter beta. But now, because we have an individual based model and we are talking about context between pairs of individuals, we uh, apply these assumptions to the square root of beta, where the square root of beta is an individual parameter. And this parameter follows the gamma distribution uh, with shape uh, 3.4, such that the uh, the variation between the uh, two and a half and 97 and a half percentile of the distribution is about tenfold uh, different. And on the right, I'm showing a graph of that distribution. Then the third level of heterogeneity we are considering is um, is nested within the second, but now we also subdivide the population in 10 clusters where uh, individuals experience 90% of their contacts within the cluster and 10 uh, uh, throughout the whole population. And in ad addition to that, um, there, we assume that there is correlation between uh, cluster membership and an individual contact rate, such that the average cluster level contact rates also vary to some extent. And on the bottom right, I'm showing you um, the distribution of the expected distribution of average cluster level contact rates. Now to the first step in the simulation study. We started with two arbitrary uh, fictive data points, which I'm showing in, in uh, black bullets on the, in the plot on the right. And we estimated the, the transmission rate for each of the three scenarios. And um, this is not rocket science, and it confirms everything that previous work has shown. If you have a homogeneously mixing model, you overestimate the transmission rate and thus are not. And if you account for more heterogeneity in the population, you estimate lower transmission rates. And as a result, lower uh, um, epidemic sizes, so lower peaks. And for the assortative mixing scenario, you get a little a somewhat protracted epidemic tail. Now, because this is, is an IBM, an individual based model and not a deterministic model, we can also think more about what is actually causing this pattern. And as it turns out, um, these heterogeneous contact rates they lead to selection and depletion of so-called high-risk individuals during the initial epidemic stage, meaning that towards the peak and the end of the epidemic, the, um, the say, fire accelerant has been depleted and you're left with low, relatively low-risk uh, susceptibles to keep the epidemic going. Now, if we do the same for a scenario where we again estimate the transmission rate on the first based on the first two data points but we also estimate the intervention effect based on a data time series shortly after the implementation of say a lockdown um, we get the following result we estimate that the transmission rate is reduced in each of these three scenarios to a sort of similar degree though there is a, a, a pattern where um, the intervention effect is estimated to be highest in the in homogeneously mixing population and the intervention effect is lowest so uh, 46 percent reduction leading to a 45 percent remaining transmission in the assortative mixing uh, scenario and these three models uh, they reproduce these data just fine and even their predictions for continued interventions which are the solid lines here they they are nearly indistinguishable and they don't have any different implications for policy now however 
if we ask these models, what if we were to suspend interventions as soon as we reach, say, 100 prevalent infectious cases in this population of 10,000? What might happen? Well, because um, the rate at which high-risk uh, individuals are selected and depleted differ between these three models, the predictions also differ. And clearly, the homogeneous model is more pessimistic as it assumes that the risk distribution of the remaining susceptibles is the same as the risk, distri risk distribution at the start of the epidemic, meaning that there's much more potential for um, a, a second or last wave. Um, so this, this confirms that estimated transmission rates and thus are not, as well as intervention effects, are model specific. Um, but what, what we are the first to show is actually that this assumption of deterministic models that the risk distribution or heterogeneity is the same at the start as the end of the epidemic is flawed. And if you want to capture this in a, in a deterministic model, you need to do some, uh, you need to define many, many risk strata, which is usually not feasible. And that's why we do individual based modeling. Now, what does this imply? Okay, summarizing high heterogeneity in individual contexts, which we here mean to include transmission probabilities, leads to lower residual transmission potential towards the end of an epidemic. And this can only be partially captured by deterministic models, but is straightforward to implement in individual based models. However, the major challenge here is quantifying this level of heterogeneity with data. And if there are any network people out here in the audience, I hope they they will nod and confirm that it is quite challenging to analyze network data and say something about heterogeneity in transmission probabilities, because that will often remain unknown. This means for our current situation that the predicted effects of scaling down interventions may be too pessimistic, especially if our models do not capture enough heterogene heterogeneity in contact rates. And it may be that current recommendations for lifting control measures may be overly cautious, at least in the Netherlands. And I'm just throwing this out there for discussion after seeing uh, uh, the last speaker's um, image on, on those trends in Israel, where the amber curve, that pattern was attributed to the effect of vaccination. Well, actually, we might be overestimating the effect of transmission, uh, the effect of vaccination on transmission, because at that point in the, in the epidemic, we may have already depleted most, if not just many of our high risk populations, subpopulations. Two minutes, Luke, if you yeah. Thanks. I'm rounding up. This is uh, my last uh, point. Um, at the start of uh, my uh, uh, presentation, I highlighted the, the spectrum of models and on the far right were the network models. Um, I want to argue that even explicit network models may be too pessimistic because they often focus on, on uh, uh, graphs that simply re uh, represent contact frequencies. Um, and do not necessarily uh, capture transmission probabilities, which depend on the quality of behavior as one of the previous uh, speakers already mentioned. And as such, even these models may be too pessimistic about the prospects of lifting control measures be, uh, towards the end of epidemics. Our next steps will be to uh, uh, make this, this exercise a little more uh, um, applicable to the Dutch situation by uh, reproducing the Dutch COVID-19 epidemic <laughs> under various assumptions uh, about uh, heterogeneity. And uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, a few colleagues who uh, I worked, had the pleasure of working with over the last few weeks and months, uh, wrangling the model and all the data that went into it. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, uh, and my thanks to all three uh, speakers. Uh, I, um, I, in normal circumstances, we'd have a round of applause, but, but if we can take that as, as a given, I'll move to our invited discussants. And uh, uh, Justin, are you on the line and are you happy to go first? I know you've had a bit of a hiatus out there. Uh, yes, if, if folks can forgive me for being maybe slightly 
less, uh, slightly more discombobulated than normal. You can um, have 10 minutes to get ready if you like, and I'll call on Phil O'Neill. Yeah, if you if you don't mind, just, Phil, just to give me a second. because I. are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Phil, for the benefit of those who haven't been following the chat, Justin Lesler was, was told to evacuate the building he was in about 20 minutes ago. So it's very understandable he needs to compose his thoughts. Phil, you have 10 minutes. OK, thank you. Let me just uh, see if I can share my screen. Uh, OK. <clears throat> OK, can you see that? Yep. OK, good. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much for the um, organisers for putting together this uh, nice meeting. And thank you also to the uh, speakers and uh, co-authors um, for the nice work that they've uh, put together. So I'm just going to sort of talk generally for about uh, five or ten minutes uh, on three different topics. So these are sort of related to what we've been hearing about this afternoon already. Um, some of it you've already heard because, of course, people have made these points uh, and some of it uh, is sort of looking at slightly broader um, issues. So the three things are, first of all, RT. So that's really what we're particularly interested in today. Uh, but then broadening out to look at estimation and models and then say something about uh, heterogeneity. So let's start with RT. So um, although Chris already said some of these things, I thought it's good to step back slightly and just consider uh, why RT is apparently such a big deal for COVID. So certainly these um, time varying reproduction numbers have been around quite a while and estimation methods for them have also been around quite a while, certainly since the early 2000s, if not before. Um, but having said that, my, my impression from what I know of the literature and what I've seen before uh, is that often the way people use them is to look retrospectively or sometimes in real time at outbreaks and try to use them to uh, evaluate what is going on. So it's almost like a sort of a summary of a description of the epidemic. And obviously it makes most sense uh, when you have a situation where things vary over time. Now, of course, even in an SIR model in a homogeneous mixing population, RT is actually still time dependent. Uh, but nevertheless, it's often the case that we're more interested when there are things actually changing. So typically uh, the introduction of uh, some kind of control measures uh, or mitigation or possibly depletion of susceptibles if the population is small enough for that to um, really matter. But I think one thing that's perhaps a little bit more distinctive about COVID, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, is that RT seems to be used not only as a way of understanding the epidemic, but also assessing interventions. Um, and maybe that's a little bit more unusual, that it seems to have uh, gone beyond something just describing uh, the outbreak into a way of deciding whether or not things are working as they are proposed in order to um, bring things under control. Um, Chris also um, in his talk mentioned briefly the fact that um, we don't usually see feedback in epidemic models. So of course one of, one of the things, you know, the vast majority of transmission models that are out there and the modeling work that goes on just assumes that things are set up, there might be some time variation uh, for example, seasonality of infection rates, this kind of thing. Um, but there's very little, uh, with the exception of some work done in HIV AIDS modelling, on feedback in the sense that behaviour change or response to epidemics. And uh, just as an aside, I wonder if that's something that uh, needs to have a bit more investment. It's a very, very challenging thing to do um, because I think we have enough difficulty accurately modelling epidemics without having to also include models for human responses or government responses. OK, my next point is RT adequately defined. So we've heard a little bit about what RT is, so you can define it in an informal way or a formal way. Uh, if you go back to, for example, 
uh, Jakob Allinger and Peter Tunis's paper in 2004, where they talk about an estimation method. It's defined in a slightly informal way. Uh, Christoph Fraser in his 2007 paper uh, defines two versions of RT. One is the so-called instantaneous number, which is really saying what is RT at the moment if nothing else ever changes, and then also a case reproduction number, which is essentially what actually happens as RT still changes. So in other words, the actual cases you observe. So there's two subtly different versions of it there, and it's the instantaneous one that, in fact, people are generally interested in. But if you contrast this with what happens in R0, so in the modelling literature, uh, again, Chris had a slide with a whole different uh, t a table of values for R0 for different models, um, but even within different models, uh, depending on their complexity, there can be different ways of defining R0. And the canonical example of this is household models, uh, where you can define R0 in several different ways, uh, often with the same threshold value of, of R0 equals one, leading to uh, you know, the point at which criticality is reached. Um, but nevertheless, slightly different definitions, uh, varying in their sort of mathematical complexity and their um, interpretation. So I guess an open question is, is there room to do this with RT? Like, do we need to do that um, as we think of more uh, complex modelling situations with more heterogeneity? Do we need a, a more nuanced way of describing what's going on? The final point on this slide, which again has already been mentioned, but let's let me emphasise it once again, because this is something we don't often see in the media. Uh, uh, is that RT will somehow depend on the population structure or and or the model that we're talking about and is not transferable. This does not stop many people um, transferring it. So uh, you'll very often see a modelling um, paper where the, the value that we're going to use for R0 or for RT is, is taken from some other situation and just sort of substituted in without uh, perhaps full recognition uh, of this intrinsic dependency on the actual population that we're talking about. So that's a little bit about uh, RT. Now let's uh, talk for a few minutes about estimation. So um, I think we'll hear a bit more about this in the session on Friday morning, but let me just briefly mention two ways of doing estimation. And again, some of this has come up uh, earlier today as well of what Nick was saying. Um, one way of doing estimation is to have a mechanistic model, so the kind of thing that we heard about uh, in Luke's talk, um, in which R, now R here could be R0 or RT or even a, a growth rate, uh, is, is an in a parameter of the model or it might be a function of the parameters of the model as well. Uh, and of course the problem with this, as Chris was saying, is that in order to produce these kind of models that are useful or realistic for in the pandemic situation, you need a lot of assumptions. Uh, estimation can be very challenging. Um, and so I would flag this up as an area that needs really more research attention. So there's a lot of um, technical difficulties with fitting large scale models to data without making a lot of assumptions um, along the way. So it can be done, but um, there's a lot more which could could be done here. And I think it would work as a nice complement to the second view. And what is the second view uh, that I'm going to tell you about? Well, it's the one that we've really been hearing about already uh, in Chris's talk, uh, where essentially we have a sort of time series approach. So it's using a sort of auto regressive time series, uh, or you can think of it as a sort of renewal model, if you like. Um, and the advantage of this approach is that you don't assume an underlying transmission model. So it's really like saying if we observe, for example, an incidence time series, we try and have a way of explaining it. Um, and the explanation depends on the um, serial interval or, well, ideally the generation interval. But as Chris mentioned, that usually this is substituted with the serial interval, uh, which we observe from symptom to symptom, from primary to secondary case. Um, and so, and, and also RT itself is a sort of a parameter in this model. So we try to essentially in this, in this approach, what we're trying to do is to explain where this incidence curve comes from by using the data in what we observe itself, plus some other information. Of course, it's a much simpler setup. 
Yes, OK. Thank you. Uh, it's a much simpler setup. It may be a bit simplistic, um, as um, is demonstrated in the paper. Uh, Chris didn't talk about this in the talk. There's sensitivity to the generation time interval. Um, and one open question is, is there any way of uh, determining or saying something about how the misspecification affects the estimation? So, for example, if you get the mean right and the variance wrong, can you say anything about what impact that has? And an associated question is, is it possible or even sensible to try and estimate the generation time in distribution simultaneously uh, with RT rather than as a two step process, which is uh, often what happens? OK, and just finally, um, heterogeneity again. So this is really the subject of Luke's talk, and, and of course it's vitally important. Um, one thing I would comment on is that um, perhaps in the short term it's not as crucial as in the long term. So certainly at the beginning of a pandemic, um, if one was to uh, try to predict what's going to happen in six months time, then the model is really going to drive the predictions vastly. But if we're only looking in a short term window, maybe it's it's not such a crucial thing. Uh, one kind of heterogeneity that I think often gets overlooked in models uh, is to do with uh, what happens day by day. So a very simple example is schools are open or schools are shut at the weekend or people do different things. Uh, you know, this is something we're aware of, but we don't often see it in models. And of course, the final type of heterogeneity, which is very topical at the moment. But again, I wonder how this can feed into estimation uh, without making uh, too much use of um, very detailed data uh, is what do we do about variance or heterogeneity uh, of the pathogen itself. OK, so that's all I'm going to say, just really reiterating a few things and uh, raising a few points for discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank for, you if you stop sharing stop now sharing and, now, uh, and uh, our uh, next uh, discussions uh, will be, I believe, just in lesson. Hi. Hi. Yes. So um, I don't. I don't have any slides. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, okay, it went away. Uh, yeah. So I don't. I don't have any slides, but I'll um, hopefully. Uh, I have. A, I have a few comments, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Jessica Metcalf, um, who I talked over a lot of this with, and and helped me uh, think about these. Um, comments. I, I um, you know, so I think my view um, on the, you know, this set of papers and uh, coming out of reading this set of papers and thinking about R more broadly as general is that, you know, R is a pretty decent summary statistic, but it's just a summary statistic. And I think if we think of it in the way we think about other summary statistics like the mean, uh, you know, some of the discussions about it, like, start to feel like, you know, like they make sense, but they're not necessarily about R so much. I mean, it is a little bit different. It captures, you know, the number of, or it's meant to capture how many people a single case will infect. You can have different, you know, nuance on that definition, but that's essentially what it's meant to capture at a particular time. Um, and it's not meant to capture anything else. And, and the, its big difference between something like the mean is that it really is, it has this very mechanistic interpretation um, or mechanistic thing it's, it's meant to capture around a particular process. And, and I think some of the conversations in the, the around it and in these papers uh, somewhat could be seen of, as asking a, an important question. Is that mechanistic interpretation or is being tied to that mechanistic interpretation, is that a feature or is that a bug? Um, and I think that's, it, it, and it's an interesting question. Um, certainly, you know, it, certainly use of R, particularly depending at the population level you look at, smooths over a lot of heterogeneity as, as, as you know, one of the speakers says, and that can lead to um, massive misinterpretation of uh, how things might unfold in particular interventions and the like. If you if you if you take, um, I think my my um, you know favorite example is always, uh, or one of my favorite examples is always uh, the Ebola epidemic in uh, 2014 in West Africa, 
in the fall, if you looked at the overall population level R for um, the entirety of Liberia, it, it would, things were cruising up pretty fast in, in October. But if you broke that down and looked at the uh, individual uh, individual spatial units, um, most of them had, you know, pretty quickly turned around and had a R less than one. And it was more the spatial expansion of the disease than it was the individual epidemics that were um, driving things, which can lead you to a pretty massive interpretation of what's going on. Just like if you um, take the mean of a very large, po you know, heterogeneous population and look at that, you might have a massive interpretation about what the real variation of, um, you know, the real variation of whatever thing you're measuring, blood pressure or the like, is in the population and um, might act accordingly. And, you know, this, um, and, and this gets to another thought that, um, you know, not the smoothest transition ever here, but like this gets to another thought uh, that comes to um, what what um, Jewel and colleagues were t talking about um, in terms of, you know, what does our, you know, it's the summary statistic and it captures this thing that can have, that can be interpreted in two ways. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned Christoph's paper but th that gets at this, that like you, there is a empirical RT that you know, we want to go out and measure and retrospectively look at, or even at the time we're reacting to an epidemic, go out and measure that saying how many people are actually being infected by each case. But there's also, because it has this mechanistic interpretation, there's kind of this intrinsic RIT that exists even if we can't observe it because there's no cases. And when you get to these, it, these situations like Taiwan and New Zealand, that um, that sort of more ethereal uh, intrinsic RT is really important because even though it's not telling us much about what the impact of like the immediate impact of increasing an intervention would be and the like, it is telling us something important about how quickly things could go south if, um, you know, in combination with the generation time, how quickly things could go south if the, if the disease actually makes it in. And I, I think an understanding, I don't know how, um, you know, how explicit they've been about it, but an understanding of that intrinsic, potential intrinsic RT in, um, in places that have managed to keep coronavirus, the COVID-19 under control and, and outside of their countries um, has driven a lot of their policy and a lot of how aggressively they've chosen to respond to these last, um, uh, in, in last entrances. And I think thinking about the, thinking about the, the, you know, time varying reproductive number in this summary statistic manner, I, I felt, um, Parag's paper, like, I felt like that really, um, you know, got to that to me is like, okay, because I felt like that's contrasting with a different summary statistic that does, um, you know, that does something different tells you something a little bit different. It shows you, tells you a little bit more information about time, a less, a little bit less information about, you know, what things are like critical thresholds for control and the like, because we are not getting this individual level perspective on transmission. Um, but also, you know, because in, in so far as it is measuring the same sort of growth process, you know, requires analogous assumptions to how we measure an empirical RT. And, um, you know, in a way you forces you into this trade-off. Are you more comfortable making, um, making a statistical smoothing assumption or are you more comfortable making a, a generation time uh, based assumption, you know, based on your mechanistic understanding of disease? And, that, and which of those you're more comfortable making is, is going to depend a lot on where you are in the epidemic in your current situation. Because, um, you know, if, if you have five cases, you know, the statistical smoothing assumption or, you know, is not going to be, be helpful. And you really have to go to the generation time and what happened in other places. If you have thousands and thousands of cases growing, it, this statistical smoothing assumption just might be better because you can more directly support it by the data. And I, and I liked um, just to quote um, from this talk and say, which assumptions are we more happy to make? Is it so, you know, like, so just to say is 
you know, R, to summarize, I think it's, you know, R is, is a summary statistic in my view. It's useful because it's mechanistic and we can translate, it has this direct translation into models, um, but that comes with some, comes with some price. And I think we've talked a bit about the price um, today. Um, and its utility is going to be limited by this its structure of what it measures. Um, you know, and we need other statistics to go along with it. Just like reporting a mean, you know, I think most of us in this crowd would say reporting with a mean without a variance, uh, some measure of the variance is tad amount to, you know, scientific misconduct. Uh, you know, reporting uh, R, you know, reporting R of T, you know, uh, or a measure of R, any measure of R without some measure of temporal growth or in some measure of background prevalence, you know, relying on that alone is simply not appropriate. Um, you know, and other measures of the disease incidents are going to that capture the same thing might incorporate those better or less well, but they're going to have some of the same assumptions. So um, I think, you know, that in, you know, so I think it's a useful summary statistic. I think to, to maybe disagree with slightly the um, previous speaker, I think part of why it's useful is it does, can be used to measure the um, impact of interventions, at least retrospectively, accounting for all this other stuff we've talked about. But, um, you know, it's nothing more, you know, it it's not, you know, it's not something special or unique and it shares the limitations we would expect with any other statistic of similar um, of similar sorts. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, and thank you for making the Mercy Dash from North Wolf Street to wherever you are now, much appreciated. Um, so John Kingman is an invited discussant, but uh, he's asked me to read his, his discussion because he uh, doesn't have access to a microphone. So I shall do so and hope I can do justice to John's well-known stentorian tones. Uh, it has long been the society's tradition that when papers are read and discussed, the early discussants make a vote of thanks to the authors and I happily do so today. I would extend those thanks not only to the present authors, but to all the modelling groups here and abroad who've tried to make sense of the epidemic as it involved and to assess the likely effects of possible ways of mitigating its effects. Two years ago, we knew nothing about this new virus. There's still much to learn, but the progress that has been made alongside the development and manufacture of new vaccines has been a remarkable achievement. Tribute too should be paid to the British public who have accepted radical changes to their way of life in order to cooperate with measures to reduce the spread and virulence of the epidemic. My comments are about the way the public has been informed and must not be construed as criticism of the detailed technical work behind the scenes. At the outset, it was explained that as Kermack and McKendrick pointed out in 1927, an epidemic has a critical threshold and it will not take hold unless the initial rate of infections exceeds the rate of recovery or death of infected individuals. The R number is the ratio of these two rates. And if greater than one gives a rough idea of the factor by which mixing must be reduced to bring the epidemic under control. The UK government drew on the work of the various groups modelling the epidemic to announce a value of the R number, and this has been updated every week. Unusually for official statistics, it takes the form of an interval estimate, currently 1 to 1.2. The length of the interval has varied, and it has often overlapped the critical value 1. This imprecision is not ordinary statistical variation because several of the modelling groups announce values of R to two decimal places. It seems to be caused by the fact that the estimates from different groups vary widely. This is not surprising because different models make different epidemiological assumptions and their definitions of R reflect these. It's not that some are right and some are wrong. The late George Box used to say that all models are wrong, but some are useful. The usefulness of the different models lies not in their promulgation of R, but in the detailed insight they offer into possible interventions to control the epidemic. The public was not, however, told that the published R number was a compromise between the artefacts of different models. On the contrary, we were told over and over again to the extent that my 11 year old granddaughter solemnly explained it to me that R is the average number of people to whom an infected person transmits the disease. We were therefore invited to envisage the epidemic as a branching process, supercritical when mean family size R exceeds one, lending itself to graphic imagery with successive generations of R squared, R cubed, etc. infections. Since R is dimensionless, this simple picture gives no insight into some of the most important quantities, like rates of hospitalization or death. 
It's therefore necessary to introduce time by making the branching model age dependent. The theory of age dependent branching processes was well studied 50 years ago and anticipates some more recent progress in epidemic theory. Thus, we specify the way in which the average number R of infections are distributed along the lifetime of the infection. This is a measure of total mass R, and we then compute its Laplace transform, phi of theta. This is a function of a positive real variable with phi of zero equals R, and there's a unique value of R with phi of R equals one. This value of R, little r, is then the rate of exponential increase in the number of infectives. The equation phi of theta equals one occurs several times in the papers for this meeting. First as equation three in Parag, Thompson and Donnelly. It's seen as relating uppercase R and lowercase R, but it only does so if the infective distribution is fixed. In practice, interventions do not just change capital R, but may radically alter the distribution. This is particularly germane to the current epidemic because infections may be transmitted before symptoms appear. Thus, uppercase R is not a safe measure of the seriousness of the epidemic. It's possible for uppercase R to be decreasing when lowercase R is increasing and vice versa. I therefore think that Parag, Thompson and Donnelly are too generous to the capital R number, even in the simplest situation. The balance shifts much further against capital R when it is observed that the current epidemic is far from homogeneous. Throughout the past 18 months, the epidemic has behaved differently in different parts of the UK, let alone the wider world, in different age groups, different social classes, different ethnic groups. Care homes and prisons have shown diverse effects. To try to summarise this variation in a single number is absurd. The simplest way of seeing this is conceptually to disaggregate the population into different types and to invoke the theory of multi-type age-dependent branching processes. The capital R number must be, must be replaced by an R matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by the different types, the IJ element being the mean number of type J susceptibles infected by an infective of type I. The criticality parameter is now the spectral radius equal to the largest eigenvalue of the R matrix, and the epidemic grows exponentially if this exceeds one. The Laplace transform phi of theta is replaced by a matrix uppercase phi theta, and the overall growth rate lowercase r is the value of theta for which its spectral radius equals one. This is where the concept of local r, that's at the original title of this meeting, falls into place. The average number of infections by a type I infective is the ith row of the R matrix. Knowing all these row sums does not determine the spectral radius, although it is the case that this lies between the largest and smallest of the row sums. In this analysis, it makes no sense to talk of an overall national R number, but it does make sense to talk of a national growth rate. For decision makers, the primary concern is with total deaths or total hospital beds needed, so lowercase r is of prime importance. To summarise, national uppercase r is meaningless, local uppercase r does not even determine criticality. On the other hand, to talk of cases increasing by a percentage week on week or doubling or halving in so many days is both understandable and verifiable. It is too late in the current epidemic to banish the uppercase R number from public discourse, but I hope it can be pensioned off before the next one. Thank you, Sir John. OK, so we now move to contributed discussants. And first on my list is Professor Stephen Riley. Steve, can you uh, get the floor? Uh, I can try. Um, okay. I don't immediately... I don't have a sharing screen. Luth, Luth will allow you to share the screen. Luth, can okay. you let Steve Riley share the screen? Uh, Just I'm a gonna, second. All right, I'm going to make a few comments before I share anyway. So, okay. um, and I'm aiming for five minutes. Is that right? Five minutes max, Steve. Max. Yeah. Okay, so I'll try and be inside that. Um, and so I'd like to make some general comments that link in with the theme and with the specific presentations. And then I'll try and flash a few slides up from um, from the React study, which I think has been mentioned already and kind of does contribute to this discussion. So I think on on these topics, I think prevalence is the most important metric because it's proportional to risk. And I think that's what the public should be most interested in, <laughs> even if they're not. Maybe it's our job to educate them a little bit more. Um, I think the real time growth rate um, uh, or a measure of the speed of increase or decrease of prevalence is also crucially important. So people know what kind of situation we're in in a very broad way. And then translating those growth rates into um, a, a gradient 
that reflects the strength of transmission, the, the big R, the R number, is also useful, but is much more fraught um, for potential methodological biases and for misunderstandings. Um, so I would, in the in the the in the among the statistics that are most commonly talked about, I would impose a hierarchy in that kind of way uh, and try to suggest that we that we focus on that. In the UK, my memory is for a very brief window, we presented R and prevalence as, as equally important concepts for a very small number of weeks at the beginning. I remember a cartoon slide um, from the government, but I'm not, I think the prevalence died away for some reason. I don't fully understand. Um, and then kind of linking back into the, the talks that have been done today, I think um, I, thinking about the first talk we should accurately measure both um the real-time growth rates or some measure of growth and uh, the reproduction number i don't think it should be an either or uh, kind of as i've already mentioned um i i'll use some examples from the react study to specifically address some of the frailties um from the second talk and then i think on the the final talk about heterogeneity which was is is interesting and important i i'll try and show how we can measure some of the key heterogeneities with reasonable accuracy using kind of novel sampling frameworks and and i think the main point i'd like to make there is that we're capable of measuring more than we're capable of accurately describing in either statistical models or mechanistic models and i think we do need to distinguish those two activities between measuring for example the accurate distribution of age um, of people infectious at any point in time and how that's changing over time versus having a fully integrated mechanistic model of, of how those things work. They're two different challenges. Um, and I think we've perhaps somewhat distracted by the technical challenge of being able to mechanistically describe heterogeneity rather than necessarily the observational challenge or the, um, the epidemiological challenge of actually measuring it. And then when we see blindingly obvious patterns of the infection being in primary school kids and young adults, we can take action based on that without necessarily being able to fully propagate um, a transmission model. So uh, those are kind of the, the broad points I wanted to make sure I got out at the beginning um, in case I run out of time, which I inevitably will. You will, now, Steve. You got to about two and a half minutes. <laughs> Perfect. That's just on the timeline I made, Peter. Um, and then let me just find the, uh, find the slides that I made. Give me one second. Um, okay. So this is, um, you should be able to see a Google Slides window there. Um, this, there's a large collaboration between Imperial, DHSC, and Ipsos Mori. Um, and the REACT study is, really was uh, set up amongst a, you know, a large group of people with, with different objectives. But one of the objectives was to address these frailties and prevalence, little r and big r, in an integrated way. Where we're actually kind of measuring we're, we're integrating the collection of data. So we attempt a random sample of the population um, represented across, across local areas. Um, and we ask people to complete us, to give us a swab, complete a questionnaire, and then we go on and do the same analysis each round. It runs for two or so weeks each month. And then we can look at the properties within rounds and between rounds. First thing, it's a random sample of people registered for healthcare, and we get a pretty good response rate. This is with no monetary incentive. You can see that it's falling across the study. Um, but for an infectious disease uh, survey, where you send someone a letter and you want to end up with a swab tested for the virus, um, those response rates are pretty good, even though they're falling. It lets us make this table one, and I should mention Paul Elliott, who's, who's uh, kind of a colleague that's worked incredibly hard on this with me as well and driven this and and i think he feels that 99 percent of the effort is worth it just for this table because we can give people to the best of our knowledge an accurate measure of the risk the average risk that they're experiencing because of infectious people around and you can show how that risk is changing massively over time we can then go to look at uh, describe how that prevalence changes by defining growth rates and R. And I think the key point here is that we're very explicit about the time period over which it applies. So we look, we can define within round R numbers. So within each of these groups of dots, we can estimate a gradient and look at a halving or a doubling time, or we can choose to look at the gradient and the R number across multiple rounds. And we would use both of those and they address different questions and we're very explicit about how we do that. 
Um, we can look individually at regions, so we can start to address the spatial heterogeneity, and then we can just read off how the age distribution or the regional distribution have changed from one round to another. Um, and this this is getting to the point I made earlier about trying to accurately reflect changes in these key heterogeneities, even though we don't immediately have a way to incorporate them into summary statistics. So I think I've probably timed this reasonably well. Um, have I got about a minute, Peter, or am I? Uh, about minus 30 seconds, Steve, really. Very, 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 very quickly, please. So very quickly, the, the one additional overall point I think that's that's borne out by React and, and relates to the other talks as well, is that beta really isn't constant. And a lot of our analytical techniques and models seem to either describe the change in beta as the main explanatory variable, or assume that beta is constant and try and explain changes in incidence using other features of either our statistics or the model. I think one of the things we've definitely learned from React is that even at a national level, there are lots of unexplained changes in beta that we need to include in our thinking when we design these statistics. I'll leave it there. Thanks for the extra time. Thank, Peter. Thanks very much, Stephen. Sorry to be brutal on the time. Um, OK, uh, I have uh, John uh, Dagpana. Uh, John, you, you, uh, if you would like to take the microphone, uh, metaphorically speaking, you have up to five minutes, up to emphasise. Are you still there, John? Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, John. Thanks. Um, OK. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't used time to, um, Teams before, so I'll do my best. Um, how do I share my screen, please? Luth, can you uh, give John Dagpana access to screen share? I think John can share his screen already. Okay. Up arrow near the top right of your screen, John. Sorry, top right of the screen. Upward arrow, click. Upward. Uh, uh. Close to the leaf, uh, red uh, leaf button, button. there is a uh, arrow that says share content. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, there are various icons, and there is a little screen with an up arrow. Is that Good. the one? Click that one, yes. then, John. Once you open it, you can. Click on share your screen and we'll see your desktop. Right. Um, all I need want to do now is to show my PDF, which I how would I do that? Uh, is your PDF open already in your computer? My PDF is now open. And fantastic. Uh, can you see it? No. Oh. No yet. Let's start again. Click on the share content arrow. What do you see? What can you see? Uh, sorry, I can see. Open share tray, yes? Yes, please yeah. click on there. And just let me know what do you see? Uh, I can see desktop, window, et cetera, et cetera. Just share your desktop with us and maximize the presentation. OK, desktop. Right, now we have your screen. Microsoft oh, Teams so. would like to control the computer. That's an open system preferences, I suppose. Yes, if you uh, don't mind to accept that. So if you don't mind to open your presentation and maximize it, we'll be able to see it. Shall I just read my... Um, Why not? And then uh, I can send it to you later. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be better, John. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I can actually see it now. Yeah. You, you can see it. Yep. If you make it big, we will be yeah. able to see it. Just okay. maximize it. Make it big. Yeah. That's great. That's clear. We yep. can see it. Yep. Right. Excellent. Okay. The first point is uh, uh, Chris's on Chris's uh, excellent paper. Um, the uh, time dependent reproduction number uh, seems to come from. Wallinger and Lipschitz, um, and it can be expressed in terms of the moment generating function of the generation uh, interval uh, evaluated at minus the um, growth rate. This does assume that the growth rate uh, is constant, the R is constant, um, but I query whether that would be the case. So if we look at um, 
the first line, uh, you have the usual renewal equation, and then assuming exponential growth in the second equation, uh, you then come to the um, reproduction number RT, uh, and instead of um, e to the minus ru in the denominator, you have the, a sort of cumulative um, growth uh, rate. So I do wonder whether um, whether that makes a big difference. I think it will make a difference if the growth rate is changing appreciably over the domain of the, um, the generation interval. That was my first point. And the second point, um, to, I suppose, to both, to all three authors, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, um, it seems difficult to get the distribution of the generation interval. Um, um, but the reproduction number depends so much on that. Um, changes in the quarantining, isolation, and effectiveness of contact tracing uh, could well easily lead to shortened generation intervals. So is it not the case that assuming a stationary distribution of generation interval can easily lead to biased estimates of the reproduction number? And if that is so, that is an argument very much in favour of growth rate rather than reproduction number. And as an example of this, um, perhaps I might just say something about some work I did uh, last week on trying to obtain the increased gen, um, transmissibility of the, of the Indian variant, the, the Delta variant. Um, here you've got uh, two reproduction numbers, one for the alpha variant, one for the delta variant, and the transmissibility, assuming uh, gamma generated um, uh, gamma, gamma distributions, the increased transmissibility is given by this thing here, where mu is the mean generation interval. And you can see here that this increased transmissibility depends so much upon the mean of the generation interval. Uh, which I would contend is very difficult to find with a good degree of accuracy. And just to make the point, here we see some calculations for different means and also shape parameters or standard deviations, 5.2, 3.7, 6.78. Here are the different uh, calculated transmissibilities for the delta variant. In this column here, R1, you have the alpha variant. Well, not too much variation there, but here for the delta variant, quite a bit of variation. And then when you take the ratio and subtract one, you get great uncertainty in the increased transmissibility. Actually, um, I posted this thing last week on Med Archive, which might be of interest. Um, I think that's what I want to say. Uh, sorry, I wasn't very... Uh... No, no, thank you, John. That's uh, very pertinent, much, much appreciated. Uh, the next name I have uh, in, in terms of their alter ego on the screen is Dorothy, brackets guest, but this might be Ian Reynolds in disguise. Uh, is, is, uh, whoever that is, are they still there? Yes, yes. Brilliant. Would you like that, to ask your question? That is the case. I'm, I'm concerned about uh, R and asymptotic cases. Um, because uh, asymptotic cases affect both the numerator and the denominator. And it's, it's very clear that they vary by age. Um, and and that, uh, that, that means that... Sorry, John. Um, sorry. Uh, I just... Sorry, did you want me to do something? Stop, stop screen sharing. Go back to that arrow, but uh, I can click it again. I'm sorry. There should be a cross now. Um, Thank you very much. And again. Yep. Sorry, I... carry on, please, uh, Ian. Right. So, so asymptotic cases vary by age. Asymptomatic, or, I think you mean. A asymptotic, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, that clearly uh, is affected over time by vaccination, as I suspect that um, fewer elderly people are asymptotic and they're getting vaccinated. So the proportion of asymptotic cases uh, will be increasing. However, as we've increased the number of uh, the amounts of testing, 
that will probably work in the uh, in the opposite direction. Um, so all these advanced statistical processes on capital R, I think, are a waste of people's uh, time and and statistical skill. Uh, and I would agree with Sir John earlier. For God's sake, let's drop capital R and and look at other things like. Um, uh, the number of uh, uh, of tested cases, the number of people who go to hospital, and the number of deaths. Uh, thank you for your comments, Ian. Uh, and I can reassure you that, for God's sake, is by far not the rudest thing that's appeared in print in JRSSI as the proceedings of discussion <laughs> meetings in the past. Um, please do send in your written version of that question. And Stuart Gilmore has asked uh, if he can raise a question, I think, for Chris Perrin. Uh, hello. Yes, I'm here. I'm. I'm really sorry. I wasn't expecting to give some kind of speech or any kind of. No, no, you, at all. Stuart. Let me interrupt you. You really oh. don't need to. The, this five-minute business okay. is a maximum. Just ask your question. That's okay. perfectly fine. Cool. Uh, so I'm calling in from Japan first of all. So it's very late here. Um, and over here in Japan, we don't use the R number at all for any of our assessments of risk or or pandemic response. We just use epidemiological measures that are relevant to the health system. Um, and I think you guys all know that we're doing a little bit better over here than you are in terms of the response to this virus. So um, also, I think some of my colleagues from China are involved in this, this meeting today as well. And we've all been watching in horror as you guys fall apart over this virus. Um, and one of the things that we've really noticed at the beginning last February last year was that your estimation of the basic reproduction number just seemed to be completely out of line with what we were experiencing and what we were seeing happening in China. And we were kind of desperately trying to warn you guys that you were wrong. But even in, I think, June, Chris Whitty was assuming it was 2.5 and it's just not. Um, so, and then I, seeing Chris Rogov's uh, presentation, I, I noticed he said, he said that underestimation of the effective reproduction number can happen very easily if you have misspecified the generation times. Um, and I'm wondering if in the beginning of the pandemic, when the disease is still emerging, this process of estimating generation times is extremely difficult. The misspecification is always in the wrong direction. And that leads to constant underestimation of the reproduction number until you get enough cases that you can estimate it from a growth rate. Um, which is what seemed to be happening in the early estimation that we were seeing published in the West. Um, I wonder if there's any comment about that. Um, also, I'd like to say I'd really like to see John Kingman's comments shared with us all. Um, there, were, there was a lot of information in that speech, and I'd like uh, to hear it again. Uh, um, every, everything will be available in the form of an electronic publication in the near future. That's uh, part, again, of yeah. the tradition. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. Right, right, right. Uh, those are the only names I have on my list. Would anybody else in the audience like to make a contribution? If so, please uh, let yourself be known either by shouting at me or putting a message in the chat. If not, I'm going to abuse my position. Oh, yes, I would. LP, would. LP, please. Uh, hi. Um, All right, so. Hi, yeah. You get a chance on Friday. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm happy to kind of step back if uh, if other people want to talk. Very, very happy. No, you, 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 you were quiet long enough. Please take the floor. OK, uh, so I uh, uh, OK, I have too many things I want to say, but I'll try to keep it really short. Um, in response to the just the past speaker uh, from Japan, I think comparing different countries is a lot more difficult than that. Uh, there might be a, a we might discuss about uh, early estimates of parameters, which I probably am very much in line with you in, in the criticism that you've made. Uh, but some of the early publication with lower production numbers were also uh, coming out of China and uh, Hong Kong, um, which ended up in the highest impact journals. And I think there is a thunder effect on small numbers, uh, or, or relatively small values of the reproduction number at the time. Um, we, we have worked on a publication in that direction, uh, which is basically where we were we are also discussing some of the discrepancies, some of the limitations of the reproduction number compared to the growth rate. Um, it's it's just come out in Filtrans B because once when we submitted it last uh, last year, it just it, it was just killed at review stage. And once it's over, it's over and during a during a pandemic when things are moving fast. Um, the key point is that basically um, many of the criticisms are valid, but um, 
but I don't think that the, the, the comparison and how different countries responded is necessarily all down to a number. That's all. Uh, and then I would like to comment also on uh, uh, on uh, on this uh, on many of the uh, on the discussion of um, Sir John Kingman, um, and that's probably where I have some of the uh, heaviest criticisms, if you want, like constructive criticism. There is a basically some of the criticisms that were put to the reproduction number also apply to the growth rate, I think, and uh, um, in the sense that the growth rate is also an average over time and space as well as the reproduction number. And so um, the only difference is that on top of all the issues that there are with the growth rate, you put on top a, a transmission um, parameter, a transmission model, and therefore you have an extra layer of complexity, which creates a lot of problems have all been discussed quite carefully today. But many of the issues about aggregating over sp is, is space and time um, or whether localized outbreak uh, and national uh, numbers make sense. These are all issues that apply to the growth rate as well as the reproduction number. The only additional problem the reproduction number has are in terms of the generation time distribution, which, which gets convoluted with the estimates of the growth rate. Over. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, anybody else like to speak? If not, I'm again going to suggest I might abuse my position in the chair and uh, make a contribution myself. Um, I find the right one. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, really, um, I want to take a halfway house between what uh, Chris and colleagues described as, as just smoothing empirically and the mechanistic model that necessarily underlines any uh, any re any sort of calculation of the reproduction number and the, that halfway house is to say that if you're doing linear smoothing then there ought to be an equivalent Gaussian process representation of what you're doing and the advantage of doing that is that you can make inference about the parameters in your model in a principled way and that might be a rather more trustworthy method of assessing the uncertainty of your predictions than just using a perfectly sensible but ultimately ad hoc uh, smoother. Uh, and, it, and in that spirit, I, I've written an equation here which starts from the presumption, picking up from Lorenzo's point, that it does indeed make no sense to have a single number for either the growth rate or the reproduction number. Actually, th these things are spatiotemporal processes. And the second thing is that if you're interested in the derivative of a process, the reproduction rate, it's rather useful if that derivative exists. And one way to guarantee that is to specify a model in which you have the integral of the growth rate, and it's the growth rate that's the latent Gaussian process. But when you observe um, some kind of measure of the size, the current size of the epidemic in terms of uh, case numbers, you would also like to adjust for spatiotemporal covariates, and you would also like to recognise the existence of noise in in your in your data. Uh, and the other thing that I like about this approach to uh, what I would call empirical modelling, which is halfway between purely algorithmic smoothing and uh, mechanistic modelling, is that it seems to me the inferential engine is now really self-determined by a, an application of Bayes' theorem, namely that you have uh, a model for the, for the underlying signal that you're trying to get at, which in this case is the growth rate. You have a model for the data conditional on that signal, and Bayes' theorem gives you what you want, which is the predictive distribution of the signal given the data. Uh, on specific questions um, for Chris and colleagues, um, whose paper I very much liked and found very uh, insightful, uh, these are very minor comments. The, the equation that they put down for their smoothing implied it was being done retrospectively, whereas if it's done in real time, of course, you need a one-sided smoother, which is what I've indicated here. They were a little bit sloppy in, in whether their equations were relating to estimates or estimands, and I think it matters because of the various issues around inference that we've been rehearsed in this meeting. And really just to sort of reiterate on the, the, the rationale for me offering this possible alternative way of thinking about the problem is that we're, it seems to me that the mechanistic models are more justified the more you want to actually find out of a specific disease. Smoothing methods tend to be more disease agnostic. Uh, the phrase that Crystal, uh, Chris and colleagues used was um, model agnostic. And the reason I think that's important is because if I was to hope for one thing only to come out of this epidemic is that before the next epidemic, we have a real time 
spatiotemporally finely resolved surveillance system for multiple health outcomes that's fit for purpose. Uh, and uh, we've done this before in a purely temporal uh, setting in a very different context. It's more going to be more work to make it work if it does work in the spatial temporal setting, but uh, I think it might be worth thinking about. And thank you. I'll, that's my contribution finished. OK, so um, unless there are any last minute uh, uh, thoughts from the audience, uh, I'm going to allow the academic five and suggest to the uh, lead speakers of each paper if they would like now to respond quickly just for two or three minutes uh, to what they've heard, uh, please do so. They will have the right to a reflective reply uh, in the published proceedings, uh, which can be, as I'm sure they all know, really quite extensive and detailed. But if there is anything, uh, uh, any burning uh, issues that people would like to respond to now, I'll call them in turn to, to make that response. So first would be Chris Parag. Chris? Sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, very interesting discussion. I'll just talk, touch on a very couple brief points now. And I think Robin wanted to uh, address the point about the um, about asymptomatic spread and about the underestimation of R, given I think Lorenzo and Stuart, I think, were talking about it. But just generally, um, just to say that, so I think one of the one of the speakers asked, uh, we were sort of setting it up as you have to pick one or the other. Uh, no, what we were really trying to say is just that if you want more, you might have to assume more. So as you just said nicely with like sort of the in between of a mechanistic versus an empirical smoothing, if you kind of want a bit more insight by adding in a transmission model, then you may have to make a few more assumptions, which I think is also what Lorenzo and I guess uh, John Kingman were getting at as well. And we agree that there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of issues that also apply spatiotemporally to the growth rate versus the reproduction number. And to resolve these, I think you don't want to be using these models necessarily, but I think the key problem we have is if you go to more detailed models, you end up a lot with about a prior smooth, um, all the prior assumptions and distributions that may all integrate inside. And just last comment on your point about filtering and smoothing. Um, when we were doing the reproduction number estimates there, we actually had a sort of underlying uh, Brownian motion process on R of T versus the previous R's. And we were doing actually a formal Kalman smoother in both directions, so filtering and smoothing. So we did sort of cover uh, that. I'll, I'll pass it on to Robin now, I think, if you'd allow him to chat. Cool. Thank, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I think I think you basically covered all, all of the, the main points, but I guess I just wanted to echo what John D said earlier about the fact that the generation time distribution isn't, in fact, a stationary thing, and actually it's something that changes through time. I think it's quite surprising that a lot of the current uh, reproduction number estimates or RT estimates um, are based upon generation times that were estimated right back at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so, so I guess that's the, that's the only thing that I particularly wanted to add. And then in, in response very briefly to Stuart's question in the, in the chat, um, it certainly isn't the case that uh, misspecification of the generation time always leads to underestimates of RT. And so in particular, if the generation time is an overestimate, then the estimate of RT is going to be further away from one than the true value. So in other words, it doesn't only depend on whether the generation time is an under or overestimate, but it also depends on whether RT is, is bigger than or, or less than one. Um, yeah, they, they were the things that I was going to add, but I think, I think Chris said all of the key things. So thanks. Chris, Nick, do you want to say anything? I don't have much to add. It's been very stimulating listening to all the discussion. I, I think I most resonated with um, Stephen Riley's comments that in the middle of a pandemic, um, models are terribly useful for providing insight and, and, and summaries of those models are, are helpful, but they're not really fundamentally useful in an epidemiologic sense that we, we should not lose track of what we've learned over centuries. What you need to do in pandemics is understand who, where, and when. And capturing that in real time with surveillance systems cannot be under emphasized in my opinion. And I think there's far too little 
uh, energy being directed to the quality of the data we have. And, and to some extent, I think that's why I sort of resonated with Stephen's um, remarks. I think React is a real model and it's been, as I said in our paper, unfortunately far more the exception uh, than the rule. Um, and there's still to this day reliance on things like uh, positivity and testing where we are all aware that testing frequencies are varying dramatically from day to day and place to place. So if anything, I would just want to add this plea to return to basic epidemiology of understanding what's going on rather than an over-reliance on mathematics. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and uh, Luke. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I have I have a few small comments. I uh, resonated with uh, also Steve Riley's point, though um, uh, I agree it's great that we are getting better at, at quantifying heterogeneous uh, systems, but there will always be some residual heterogeneity that we cannot capture because mobility data are noisy. The quality of contacts that people have is hard to, to capture. Um, and the second point I wanted to make is, is it related more generally to uh, the discussion of R0 and, and RT, that I, I specifically did not focus on those terms too much in my presentation, because if you would look at the three model variants or the three scenarios that I presented, they would have exactly, they're associated with exactly the same estimates of R0 and RT, exactly the same which does not tell you about what the epidemic potential actually is if the situation changes, not necessarily everything. And this also um, matches with the point that that the, the speaker from uh, Japan or the person who uh, responded from Japan uh, made, that they are using actual metrics that matter for um, um, the current state of the health uh, care system. So uh, those are the few points I wanted to make. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So uh, on uh, on a matter of process, just to remind everybody, uh, although I know uh, almost half of us have now left, um, that uh, further contributions in writing are welcome. Uh, we need them by Monday the 19th of June, and they are at a maximum length of 400 words, and everything will be published uh, electronically under the RSS banner, and the speakers will all have an opportunity to reply uh, at a certain amount of leisure and a considerable amount of detail to all of the discussion, including contributions that we have not yet received. Uh, and I think my final duty is to remind you that parts two and three of this meeting occur on Friday morning and Friday afternoon when our president, Sylvia Richardson, will take the chair. So please do register for those sessions if you haven't already done so. Sylvia, do you have any last words you want to say today before I close the meeting? You're on mute. You're still on mute. Not, not doing very well. Um, I just wanted to thank you, uh, everybody, for you know their participation and the I very much enjoy the lively discussion. And I uh, hope to see you all on Friday. So we'll have two papers uh, in the morning and two papers in the afternoon. The papers are on online, um, and so uh, very much looking forward to to have a lively discussion there as well. Okay. And I think with that then, uh, yes, I, think I, will, will. Uh, I will formally call the meeting closed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.